So what does it all mean, though, for who is going to win this leadership race? Let's ask some folks who know the party well. Lisa Raitt, deputy leader of the party, formerly, and she ran for the leadership in 2017. Rudy Husney ran for leader in 2019. He's also a former advisor to Prime Minister Stephen Harper. Michael Solberg is a former conservative staffer, now partner at New West Public Affairs. Welcome to all three of you. Lisa Raitt, I am going to start with you. That number that Hannah is talking about, north of 400,000, there are, I'll say there are rumblings that the number could even be higher than that. What does that fundamentally tell us about what's going on in this race? Well, I don't believe that we actually have an idea what the number is. Mm. Very interesting that they're throwing the numbers out, but for two reasons. Uh, the first one being is that campaigns actually will hold back mm. on a lot of their actual memberships until the very last minute. And the reason being is that they don't want the other campaigns to get the names of the candidates that they've signed up too early or the names of the people that they signed up too early. So what the party is going to be facing tonight is a deluge mm -hmm. of last minute membership applications coming in. And that's why they're saying it's going to take them a while. And I know Hannah said a couple of days. I remember when I ran the process in 2016 and 17, man, it takes a long time for this to happen. We may not know how many total numbers, truthfully, until mid-June, maybe late June, early into July. It's going to take a long time. Yeah, well, and, and there's also like there's the pro there's the, pro the process of processing all of the memberships. And then oh, yeah. also the fact that I think Hannah mentioned that the camps get to check them out, too. So we're certainly I think yeah. you're right, going to be waiting a while, although pesky reporters like Hannah and I will be trying to get to the bottom of it in the interim <laughs> if we can. Um, Michael, Sil will. Michael Silberg, I want to ask you, though, um, given what Lisa Rae just said about the fact that, like, there's a lot of spin going on here. Hannah was saying it, too, right? We, it's hard to know how much faith to put in uh, the numbers that are being given. There's a bit of a psychological warfare that's being played. Can we say anything about what this means for who is doing well in this race? Sure, sure. And, and, you know, I hope I'm not out of my depth here by <laughs> by being the only panelist that hasn't ran for a Conservative Party leadership. <laughs> but, but, An on honorary I, leadership <laughs> aspirant. <laughs> yeah, I, well, I'll, I'll take the title. I'll take the title. Uh, no, what, what I think it says, you know, above all else, is that the Conservative Party coalition and and its status as a movement is a healthy one. Uh, there really isn't any real strong marker for the health of a political movement besides the activity of its membership, how mobilized they are, how excited they are to be involved in the internal party process, and obviously how, how big and what size the membership is. Mm -hmm. And if these numbers are remotely true, uh, then the Conservative Party of Canada is a very, very healthy party. Uh, but in terms of who's ahead, agreed with Lisa, I don't think anybody knows for sure. Uh, I doesn't doubt that I don't doubt at all that these candidates are working extremely hard. Some of them have significant renown in terms of their kind of work ethic, namely Patrick Brown. We know he's been working hard. We know he does a lot of events. And obviously, Mr. Poliev has been ahead, at least in the eyes of many, since the moment he announced. Mm -hmm. uh, but in terms of who's actually going to win this thing, I don't think we know, uh, other than I think this does indicate that it's probably going to be a lot closer than we thought initially. Well, everybody, well, I don't know if every, I was going to say everybody loves the excitement of a close race, but I suppose if you're one of the uh, aspirants in the race, you may not feel that way. So not everybody. <laughs> um, speaking of aspirants, Rudy Husney, uh, you, you, you know, you, you've been in a leadership race yourself. I want to ask you not so much then, we've touched on like whether or not this tells us about something about who might win. What does it tell us about people who really don't have much of a hope? Like, do you think we could see Rudy Husney, somebody drop out at this stage of the game? I don't think so, but you will hear now maybe communication in terms of ranking candidates. Mm -hmm. Obviously, uh, you know, there's been a lot of talks about Patrick Brown and Jean Charest. We know that, you know, their game plan is to, to block Pierre Poliev's path to, to victory. But we will, it will be very interesting to hear Lesnar Lewis, uh, Roman Babber, and Scott Aitchison also, when they're going to communicate to their members, how are they also going to, you know, make a pitch in, in, in terms of the second person that they'll put on their ballot, because as you know, it's a preferential ballot. And then also mm -hmm. another thing that is going to be important is the battleground in Quebec, because mm -hmm. it's a point. You need a hundred point per riding. And even if you win all of Alberta, all of Saskatchewan, and all of Manitoba, it doesn't add to the 7,800 points that are available in Quebec. So that's also a very, very important point. And making sure that this time they have at least 100 members in every single riding in Quebec 
to have the maximum points that they can. Yeah, I guess it's voter efficiency seems to be the phrase of the day on power and politics, and that's a good example of it. Um, listen, I do want to talk about the Ontario election and what it means for all this, but Lisa Wright, actually, I'd like to ask you yeah. about something that I do see people talking about as well. Pierre Polyev sure. um, tweeted yesterday, you know, I've introduced a private member's bill to abolish all current vaccine mandates, ban any and all future vaccine mandates. Uh, this happening at this moment, where the, we're, we're almost at the leadership, mm. um, or sorry, the membership cut off. So there's this question about, you know, what do people need to do now? I know some, I've seen some people questioning, why is Mr. Polyev saying no vaccine mandates even in the future? Why is he sort of blaring that yeah. from um, a megaphone at this stage of the game when it could alienate people from outside of the party? Do you have any thoughts either about that specific strategy or more generally how you move from this phase of uh, signing up yeah. to persuasion? So I have two thoughts on mm -hmm. that. Um, I think it's a reaction to the fact that Mr. Polyev missed a vote that had to do with whether or not the vaccine mandates were going to be suspended in the House of Commons. And he received a lot of flack about that. Mm -hmm. So the best way that they could deal with it is by introducing this private member's bill, which is never going to make it to the floor mm -hmm. other than being introduced. It's not going to be voted upon, but it is putting the stake in the ground for Mr. Polyev, how he feels about this issue. But I want to contrast it to what happened last night mm -hmm. in, here in Ontario. I mean, Premier Ford threw members of his own caucus out because they would not disclose vaccination status or they didn't get vaccinated. And he won a large majority last night. Mm -hmm. So the people who voted actually were on the side of making sure that they were saying that they were OK with the vaccine mandates. I mean, that's how I interpret it, Catherine. I don't know how anyone else is going to interpret it. But for me, that just showed that whatever the premier did on vaccines, even to the point of removing his own caucus members, was something that they were very comfortable with. And to Rudy's point, there's a lot of seats in Ontario yeah. that are really important for the next leadership candidate. So, sure, Pierre had to go out and do that in order to shore up, I think, a lot of the votes that he thought he was getting flat from. But on the other side, boy, a lot of Ontarians feel quite different than that. Mm -hmm. Uh, Michael, I want to throw it over to you through the lens of what happened last night, but also, obviously, there's been some pretty big political action in Alberta, too. So two kind of, two, well, they're not even two sides of the coin, two very disparate lessons there about conservative politics. How do you apply it to this race? Yeah, no, I think, I, I you know, I think a lot of people have been on the program uh, last night, and I think the kind of the punditry of this morning has all indicated that Doug Ford is, in all likelihood, the most senior hand uh, in the Conservative coalition across the country today. Uh, he's certainly one of the most senior first ministers, period, uh, in the country uh, with his victory. And I think the narrative that he won on does have a story for this Conservative leadership race. And I think Lisa touched on it uh, in a big way. I think Mr. Polyev is playing uh, a, a dangerous game. I understand what he's doing. He, he's accessing a very mobilized voting block. Hell, uh, a thousand of them uh, or more actually literally drove to Ottawa uh, uh, to protest on this mm. issue. So I can see what he's doing, but, you know, if he's the only candidate speaking about COVID, uh, you know, and so many people, COVID is in the rear view mirror for them. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's really no social license anywhere to continue talking about COVID. Uh, I think he's, you know, he's dangerously affecting the campaign narrative, uh, on an issue that I think a lot of people in their day-to-day -day lives have, you know, kind of put behind them. Mm -hmm. So it'll be interesting to see how he pivots, uh, given, you know, how many people came out in droves to support a huge Ford majority last night. Uh, you, by all intents mm -hmm. and purposes, if you're against COVID mandates, uh, you should find unpopular. Mm -hmm. Well, he clearly recovered from that. So I'm not sure it's a great ballot box question for him. I will say Leslie Lewis and Roman Babber talking about this too. Um, I think sure. unfortunately though, we're, we're going to have to leave it there, which I know is going to leave all the Rudy Husney fans uh, aching for Hi, a little Rudy. bit more. <laughs> so extra time for Rudy the next time we talk about this. Thank you to all of you for your insights. Lisa Raitt, Rudy Husney and Michael Solberg. Hi, I'm Vashi Capello's host of Power in Politics. See more of our show by subscribing to the CBC News Channel or click the link for another video.